Welcome to Stanton MD. I'm your host, board certified emergency physician, Dr. Ryan Stanton. We have a fantastic show for you today. We'll start off with the all too common yet misunderstood diagnosis of pediatric cancer. Then we'll talk with the folks at Retina Associates of Kentucky about research and advancing treatments for the citizens of Central Kentucky. Finally, we wrap up today with a story that impacted all of us. On July 7th, 11 police officers were shot in Dallas, Texas. I went down to Dallas to visit Parkland Hospital to talk with the men and women that help treat those that risk their lives for our safety. Cancer is a word and diagnosis that seems to be everywhere. I consider this disease process to be the greatest healthcare challenge of our generation. Unlike most diseases that impact adults and the elderly, cancer also impacts children and when it does, it's incredibly difficult for all of those involved. This month I start a series on pediatric cancer in which we will look at several cases of children with a diagnosis, its impact, and how it changes lives forever. In this episode, we spend some time with Ryan Cremines. Ryan was diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma in June after his family noticed a change in his face and his vision. Since then, he has undergone surgery and chemotherapy to help battle the disease. He has done this with the help of a loving family and some support from one of the stars of the NFL. Now you get a chance to know Team Ryan and how they fight together to beat sarcoma. If you're a parent, you probably spend most of your time trying to get your kids to clean their room or to not leave toys laying around the floor. For most, the idea of a life-threatening illness is one of the farthest things from our mind. Unfortunately for thousands of parents, they must face the reality of a cancer diagnosis in their child. Eric and Ryan Cremines recall how their life went from routine to life-changing. It was a uh, it was a weekend, and we'd been out golfing uh, earlier on a Saturday, and I noticed he was keeping his left eye closed a lot, just protecting it. And I mean, it was sunny out, so I asked him if the sun was bothering him, and he's like, "Yeah." So um, later on that day, we we're at my parents watching a baseball game, and uh, my dad had noticed that Ryan had his head kind of turned sideways to look at a TV that was at about a 45 degree angle from him. And um, so when we noticed that, I asked Ryan to, to just look straight at me. And when he did, I noticed that his left eye was turned inward towards his nose. So I was like, you know, um, don't goof around, look straight at me. And he's like, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to. So that was our first indication. When I looked straight at the TV, um, I saw two, so I had to look like this. And when my grandpa noticed it, he said, hey Ryan, why are you looking at the TV like this? And I was, and I said, because it looked, because I see two of t two TVs when I look straight at it. And then he told me to look at my dad, and dad was like, look straight at me, and I did. And when I did, um, my eye was looking at my nose, my left eye. Within those first couple of days, things moved quickly. Before long, Ryan was in the emergency department at the University of Kentucky. <laughs> It was his first trip to the ER. He'd never had a stitch or anything of that nature. And um, so, you know, as, as we're sitting there thinking about all this, I mean, I just, I had a bad feeling. And as you can imagine, emotions were running high. You know, just, it was no good. And I mean, it was, you know, uh, poor prognosis for kids and rare in children. And so I was, I mean, I was destroyed. I mean, it the best way I've, I've been able to tell people is I've had, I had emotions I've never had before. You know, I mean, I, I physically was, I felt like I wanted to climb out of my own body because I just, you know, had all this fear and stress that I've never had before and I just couldn't get away from it. After that evaluation in the emergency department and the surgery to remove the tumor, the Cremines sat down with the oncologist and learned of the actual diagnosis that they would be fighting. You know, he explained that it, he has a uh, rhabdomyosarcoma and it's a sclerosing type, which is, I guess, even a more rare subset um, that originated in his sinus area, which is apparently a, a common location for these to originate. And then it had um, pushed through, you know, natural openings in the skull to where it, you know, put some pressure on the cranial nerve, you know, causing the symptom that alerted us something was going on. So, you know, it was a uh, it was a blessing that, that that occurred, that, you know, there was something, you know, physically that we could look at and say, this isn't right. Because he was, you know, otherwise 100% healthy child, played, 
you know, was playing football, baseball, swimming, you know, running, riding his bike. I mean, no issues. Prior to the diagnosis and since, Ryan has been a typical boy that loves football and baseball. Prior to his diagnosis and during treatment, he has developed a close bond with his sports hero who happens to play for the Chicago Bears. When we went to the game in December, we were saying um, hi to all the players, and Zach Miller um, walked straight up to me and my cousin and gave us a glove, and um, I sent him a two-page thank you note, and um, my dad and him have been talking on, what's it called? Oh, we're, uh, well, we would text back and forth on the messenger. Yeah. On Facebook, and he'd check in on you, and I'd mm -hmm. send him messages for you. Mm-hmm. And when, after surgery, um, when I got out, he sent me a big package, and he signed a football. He um, gave me Bears socks. He gave me Bears sunglasses, a Bears, this Bears um, bracelet, and he gave me Bears, a Bears blanket. He gave me a lot of stuff. That relationship has grown, and as Ryan started his journey through his illness, he got a call from his hero. A few day, a few nights before surgery, we talked about me having surgery because he had to miss three years of football for a surgery on his ankle. This support has given Ryan strength as he continues through the time of challenges and treatments. You know, one thing this has done. I, I mean, as far as the family and friends, we have you know, a huge support system. But, you know, to have someone like that that he looks up to as a uh, athletic hero take genuine concern and, uh, you know, talk to him and just, I mean, they talk like buddies about everything. Uh, you know, it's really just put him in such a good place mentally and emotionally and, you know, it's taken a lot of pressure off off me because I know, you know, that, that, that I have a lot of help um, as far as, you know, helping to keep his spirits up. and you know, gives them something to look forward to and, and, and anticipate. And it's, you know, it's just, you know, we can't, can't say enough about how much we appreciate just, you know, it's very minimal effort on his part, but it's, you know, it's the world to him. Ryan has used that motivation to not only endure his treatments, but to battle through and even find time to just be a kid. You know, been doing great. He's, I mean, two days after having a craniotomy, he was out, Throwing, um, throwing baseball and football and hitting baseballs off the tee, hitting golf balls. You know, I'd still be curled up in a fetal position if it was me, and <laughs> he's, uh, he's doing great. Since our visit with Ryan, he has had some great adventures, including a special camp for children with similar illnesses. But one of the highlights had to be the opportunity to throw out the first pitch at a Lexington Legends game. Ryan honed his skills and zipped a 30-mile-per-hour heater right down the pipe. Cheering him on were dozens of family members and friends that have jumped on board to help support Ryan in his battle against sarcoma. It hasn't all been fun and games during this time. He has also been undergoing cancer treatments at the UK Dance Blue Clinic and planning ahead for months of treatments. Eric and Ryan know the road is going to be a long one with many ups and downs, so they agreed very early that they were going to be together and face this as a team. And then pretty much from minute one, uh, Ryan and I have just, you know, made a made a deal that we know we're gonna have good days, we're gonna have not so good days, and you know our it's we have a long haul to go. So as you know, as a family, what we have to do is make sure that we pick each other up. But the team Ryan support has spread well outside the family to thousands throughout the bluegrass and beyond, with a Facebook page that supports Ryan and pays homage to Ryan's favorite player. Team, Team Ryan, Ryan 86. Yeah. 86 is for, for Zach Miller. Um, he wanted to incorporate that into the, into the name. It's a way for us to, to vent a little bit, to show, you know, to show Ryan's journey and, and to, you know, let people, you know, support him because, you know, and we think it's, it's huge. I mean, you know, when he's laying in the hospital and, and, you know, and, and looking at it and going, look, I've got, you know, almost 600 likes, you know, it was, you know, it was something that was, you know, that was uplifting for him. He enjoyed it because he, he was under the impression he wasn't popular. And I was like, you know, buddy, you're really popular. Yeah, Even I before can, all this, you're really I can popular. I see that I'm really popular right now. <laughs>
Ryan has a very long journey ahead with months more of treatment and then years of monitoring. Cancer is a terrible diagnosis, but together we can fight and eventually find more cures and hopefully prevention. I invite you to keep up with Ryan and his journey through Facebook page Team Ryan 86 and we will also keep up posting you with the progress right here on Stanton MD. More Stanton MD coming up. Stay with us. Justice Dental provides world-class dentistry with a hand-picked team of doctors, hygienists, surgeons, and specialists that work together to create natural, beautiful, and healthy smiles. Realizing that oral health is key to overall health, Justice Dental provides everything from preventive dentistry to full mouth reconstruction, ensuring your smile will last a lifetime. At Justice Dental, we want to do your smile justice. Do you own or work for a business that advances health and safety of the public or its employees? Then you may be interested in becoming a sponsor of Stanton MD. There are various opportunities for sponsorship, from the show to the website, social media, print, or a combination. For more information on becoming part of Stanton MD, contact Jen at info at stantonmd.com. That's info at stantonmd.com. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. Modern medicine hasn't always been so modern. Our practice is the product of generations of knowledge fueled by the testing of new treatments and technology. At one point, almost all research was through academic medical centers and medical schools. Even though this is still very common, more and more community physicians and hospitals are engaged in the trials and the research that will shape the future of medicine. I got a chance to talk with the physicians at Retina Associates of Kentucky to see how they are driving healthcare in the future of medicine. Dr. Belinda Shirky prides herself as a retina surgeon and specialist, but she also plays a key role in the future of retina care as the coordinator of research for Retina Associates of Kentucky. A retina specialist can be both academic by nature and work in a private practice. At Retina Associates of Kentucky, our interest in research dates to the late 1980s when we were investigating laser therapy for histoplasmosis. We want to be able to take the best care that we can of patients. And good research requires good data. Uh, Retina Associates of Kentucky is able to, to provide this good data because we're a group of retina-only surgeons and we value the research. So. Why do we value the research? Well, we value the research because it helps patients. We value the research because we want to provide not only the standard of care for our patients, but the cutting edge, excellent care that is available. And we can do this by our, our involvement in clinical trials and research. One of their main areas of focus is the growing cases of macular degeneration. Trials uh, to test new drugs in both the area of wet macular degeneration but also diabetic macular edema. It's the uh, most uh, common reason for people in America to lose vision if you're over the age of 50. Approximately 3 million patients will be uh, treated for macular degeneration uh, just this year. And it is the leading um, uh, uh, expense uh, for Medicare in the eye field is treatment for macular degeneration. So it is a prevalent and uh, uh, affects uh, many patients. Macular degeneration is common among the elderly. And as our baby boomer population ages, the numbers will continue to grow. The key to treatment is early identification and prevention. So they lose the ability to read or lose the ability to see uh, people's facial expressions and lose the ability to drive. The blurring in the center or distortion or dark spots in the center, those are the common presenting features of macular degeneration. The best way that you can decrease your risk for macular degeneration is to not smoke. Uh, eating a healthy diet and exercising also are uh, shown to be preventative. Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, prevention or catching the disease at its early stage. 
If you are going to get macular degeneration, even if you do everything correctly, it may be genetically programmed in your eyes to, uh, uh, to have that disease. And in those cases, the best thing to do is to get regular checkups with your eye care doctor uh, and also to watch out for any distortion or blurriness of your central vision because macular degeneration will typically affect only the center of the vision and not the periphery. Their research is focusing on the development of new drugs and surgical treatments that will hopefully revolutionize the treatment of macular degeneration. The key is that in order to have a trial, you have to have patients willing to be involved. Dr. Shirky explains why many of their patients choose to participate in research. If you know that you're uh, someone who helped develop or bring a new treatment to play, and we have several patients like that in our practice that were involved in a previous clinical trial, and uh, they are our special patients, and they know that uh, they are uh, a part of something that's even bigger than uh, just their particular eye, but the part of uh, advancing of, of a new treatment. So how can you get involved? Your eye care specialist uh, would uh, recognize that there is a problem or a, a, the disease of diabetes or macular degeneration, and then uh, they would uh, send the patient to us and uh, all patients that are a part of our practice uh, are potential candidates for a clinical trial. Um, mostly you just have to speak up that you would be interested in participating in a trial. Next time you hear about the opportunity to participate in a medical trial or research, remember that you may have the opportunity to benefit from a new breakthrough and even benefit the care of countless patients that will come after you. More Stanton MD coming right up. Don't go away. With over 40 years of service, Retina Associates of Kentucky provides care for disorders of the retina, macula, and vitreous structures of the eye. Their goal is to provide the best possible care in a compassionate, personalized, and timely manner. This is accomplished through a comprehensive, state-of-the-art mix of diagnostics, medical, and surgical services. They have 10 offices throughout the Bluegrass. Visit retinaky.com. On July 7th, our nation was impacted when 11 police officers were shot in Dallas, Texas. Five of those officers died. In a nation where tensions are running high and our protectors are becoming the targets, Dallas has become the symbol of a difficult time in U.S. history. In the wake of the tragedy and others around the country, emergency and trauma services are being brought into the light as they respond to these events, saving lives and bringing a peace of order to a chaotic and ever-changing situation. I had the privilege of spending time with the men and women of Parkland Emergency Medicine in Dallas, Texas to talk with them about the experience of being there on the night of July 7th as the bullets were flying and lives were on the line. Dallas, Texas is one of the great cities in the United States. A city built from oil and entrepreneurs, it's an expansive city of over one and a quarter million people surrounded by towers of glass buildings and evidence of its oil rich heritage. Dallas has also been thrust into the national forefront for a couple of other reasons. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas while his motorcade passed through Dealey Plaza. Then, nearly 43 years later and only two blocks away, shots rang out once again and five police officers lost their lives. Six others were injured. The scene as you pass by now doesn't reflect the events of that night, but as you walk by you see evidence of bullets flying with holes in walls and posts, windows blown out, and marks where police cars responded to the scene. Now, a barricade guarded by dozens of police from around Texas surrounds the site with ribbons, memorials, lowered flags, and police mourning the deaths of fellow officers. You also see the community coming together, with people of all races showing their gratitude for the men and women in blue. But this was not the only scene that night. The TV may have lit up with scenes of chaos at the site of the shooting, but what was not seen there were those that received the injured and fought to save their lives. 
This task fell to the doctors, nurses, and countless others at Parthen Memorial Hospital who responded to the mass shootings and surely saved lives. I am a associate professor at University of Texas Southwestern. Uh, I'm also the interim chief of emergency services for Parkland Hospital. I am a assistant professor of emergency medicine here at the University of Texas Southwestern Parkland Memorial Hospital. I am an RN, BSN, um, and I am one of the trauma nurse managers at Parkland Hospital. These were some of the folks there that night, and as the scene unfolded a few miles away, the staff at Parkland prepared and many responded from home to lend a hand. About 9 o'clock, I had hopped in the shower, um, getting ready for work, and I stepped out of the shower, looked at my cell phone, and had tons of text messages, tons of group messages from our fellow residents talking about the, uh, the shootings and what had happened downtown. So kind of got uh, dressed pretty quickly, got in the car, hopped in the car. Um, our shift usually starts about 10 p.m. I got here right at 9.30. Anytime there's a multiple casualty incident uh, here at Parkland, we've been through it a lot. We've, we've done this a lot. We've been able to kind of ramp up in the past, just actually sort of increase our capacities. I walked in and found a very well secured scene and walked into what I would describe as very well controlled chaos. A lot of compassionate providers, I think, doing a lot of good for a lot of boys in blue and gals in blue who are standing around the hospital. When I was traveling back to the hospital, um, we have other nurse managers that work in our department, so I called um, both of them and they immediately started to come to the hospital. And then additionally, we have um, basically kind of a telephone tree that we can activate if we need extra staff, but they already started calling me and the other nurse managers seeing if they needed to come in. During this time, the emergency department wasn't empty. In fact, it was still a fully functional ED with all the other cases that would be taking place on a typical Thursday night. Uh, currently, our volume within the main emergency department is up over 140,000 patient visits a year. Uh, and when you add in the patients that come into the OBGYN urgent care and the uh, urgent care emergency department, that's up over 220,000. When I walked in that particular Thursday night, uh, the waiting room was extra deep. I think there were 90 in the waiting room and about 20 to be triage, so we had some work to do. But at that time, when I showed up, there were 300 people in the emergency room. So not only were people willing to help to come in, run the traumas, to help with all the police victims. They were also willing to come in and help. Um, we even opened up the urgent care again. Our program director took one of our interns from over here, took him to the urgent care. They saw a ton of patients over there. Uh, we had people out in triage, we had doctors out in triage that were seeing patients from the waiting room and uh, dispoing them, sending them home, admitting them from the waiting room, things like that. So it was pretty amazing to see. Um, us keep a 300 or keep open our ER with 300 patients, still be able to move uh, patients in and out um, while all of this was going on as well. The key thing I heard over and over at Parkland was how they were prepared well before this tragedy to respond no matter what they had to face and it showed that night. And I think it's proper prior planning prevents present problems and we've got guys in the disaster EMS world who have got this place running a very tight ship. I know some of the community hospitals I'd worked, if this had happened to us there, this would have been a giant train wreck. And here at this particular hospital, which I'm very proud to be a part of, everything felt very smooth. We had at least two EMS guys in the field, if not three. We had one with the tactical team, and everybody was communicating via radio. They were talking with me over text messages. We knew everything that was going on. It was just all very tight and tidy. We had blocked off our critical care and trauma pods so that we knew we had extra beds in case additional patients came in. Well, at the same time, we had additional staff and faculty come in and cover our urgent care units and our, our uh, <clears throat> standard ER units so that we had more than enough coverage to get everybody seen. We've got such an amazing disaster and emergency preparedness staff here who have a great plan in place for when this sort of thing happens. We open additional ORs. We know who to call in. We've got plenty of extra staff to come in and so that folks who just folks who just happened to be walking into a shift, if they hadn't turned on the news, if they just woke up to walk in their night shift, would walk into something that was as smooth as possible where they can provide the best patient care without any disruptions. And I know that's been the goal of our disaster staff to make that ready when this sort of thing happens. In medicine, you become accustomed to injuries, illness, and even death. Sometimes it seems almost too casual and commonplace. 
but there are some things that even seep through the protective wall that comes with seeing what we do. In the world of public service and healthcare, we see ourselves as one big family that has different roles in protecting our fellow citizens. That seemed to be a factor in Dallas as well. It's tough. Um, a lot of the people we see when it comes to trauma, sometimes it's their own fault that, that it happened, sometimes it's not. Um, but these folks are just doing their job and it, it's tough to see that happen, um, to lose your life just trying to protect the lives of others. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it's definitely different than the everyday stuff that we see here. We, like most people who work in a big trauma facility, you say we see a lot of people who are gunshot wounds, we see a lot of people that are in bad car accidents. I think sometimes you can disconnect because you don't know the story behind it. Um, and for us that night, you know, in medicine, along with, you know, people that work in firemen, police, policemen and women, we're like a family. So it was definitely more personal. Um, and just the large volume, especially when you have patients that, with any patient, when they come in and they're talking to you and then they maybe don't make it, you form a connection. So I think that was hard, just also the stress of it. Um, with that many patients coming in at once, it adds a new dynamic. And of course, the events of the night eventually hit home with those in the trauma bays. I feel like I, during the entire shift, I was kind of in a state of shock. We were still, we were still accepting all motor vehicle collisions, all they were accepting trauma transfer patients as well. So for the rest of the shift, I never sat down. This was the first time where when I got home on Friday morning, normally I'm so tired, I just fall asleep. Um, I definitely couldn't sleep at all. Um, I probably slept three hours on Friday because I couldn't turn my mind off of it. Um, and it's something I've never experienced before. As we move forward from the tragedies of Dallas and elsewhere, I can only hope that we as an American society can grow, learning how we can all work together to mend fences, close the divide, and make this melting pot of democracy a safer and more supportive place. That's all the time we have for this episode of Stanton MD. As always, I thank you for joining us and hope you will continue to spread the word about the show. If you have a story, product, or technology that you feel should be on the show, contact us at info at stantonmd.com. Also, keep up with us on social media via the Stanton MD and Everyday Medicine Facebook page, as well as at Everyday Med on Twitter. And of course, our website, stantonmd.com. On the page, you can find past segments and programs, and just in case you miss them. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been Stanton MD.